Hello folks, this is Nathan, and we're in the booth of truth this very morning, in this place, as it were. And yeah, it's uh, 20, uh, 10 past 9 in the morning on a Friday. No, it's Saturday. And we're in the book Our Threat and Freedom by R.J. Rushtuni, a series of 155 lectures on Our Threatened Freedom. Okay, so let's begin series 12. Part five, now. Five, how bad is pollution? I reported on the data concerning pollution in the United States in the days of the horse and buggy. I called attention to the millions of tons of manure which then filled American cities, the germs they bred and the pollution they created. Now, I have some data on London in 1890. In those days, London and all cities had a constant aroma of ripe horse manure, which floated as dust in the air in the summer and became a wet, sloppy mess in wet weather. The reports of the day indicate that food traffic was difficult. The manure soup splashed up on everyone as the carriages went by. The Strand area usually had an 18-inch mess of liquid slop, which made for messy travel in an open buggy and major problems for pedestrians. This was not all. The noise pollution of horses was far greater than that of automobiles. The pounding of innumerable horseshoes for a horse... Brushes, something else, isn't it? For to a horse on the pavements was far more noisy than the sound of a motor. Moreover, wagon and buggy wheels did not have rubber tyres and were themselves noisy and often squeaky. Add to that the neighing of horses, the shouts and curses of their drivers, and the crack of whips, and you have bedlam. Of course, if you want real pollution, go back 200 years to 1783. Cities then often had no sewers. American cities had an outhouse smell to them. In many cities in Europe, chamber pots were emptied into the streets from upstairs windows. This made for very serious pollution for the unwary pedestrian underneath the window. Now, by comparison, we don't know what pollution is today. This does not mean that we should not continue to improve our situation, but it does mean that the cause of truth and freedom has not been served by misrepresenting the problem. Technology has not increased, but has rather decreased pollution. There's a lot of noise here. It's not coming through in the recording, so that's okay. Six. Who's taking care of the poor? One of the greatest tools used by the Soviet Union against its, against us. Hello, I'm missing information. One of the greatest tools used by the Soviet Union against us is misinformation. However, the Marxists are not alone in this, although they are the experts at it. States and federal agencies regularly give our press releases which are mild but real forms of misinformation. Too often the press, instead of digging for data, in is cont okay. digging for data, is content to use handouts. The net result is a distorted picture. Let me illustrate. The greatest welfare agency in the United States is not the federal government, but the American family. More sick members, elderly parents and relatives are cared for by the family than any other agency. Add to that the millions of children from kindergarten through high school in Christian schools financed by the parents, and you have an impressive fact. More parents pay more for college and university education than does any other agency. 
The family is history's most impressive and most successful institution for coping with human problems. A second great agency is the church. Every city has a homeless, floating population and many transients. Protestants and Catholic missions to the inner city do far more than most people realise to alleviate such distresses, and they do this with too little help, very economically, and often with real hostilities from local welfare agencies. This is not all. Some of the richest and most powerful evangelical businessmen in the United States have an organisation called Strategies to Eliminate Poverty, STEP, to work to alleviate poverty. This racially mixed group is already active in some inner city areas. Their purpose is to provide lo- Their purpose is to provide relief and to make new persons out of the poor to enable them to get ahead. They already have some impressive results. Freedom is better served if we have more information on what the free sector is accomplishing. Give me hope, Joanna. Give me hope, Joanna. Give me hope, Joanna, till the morning come. 7. Do we have a dynasty of wealth in the United States? There's a common impression that most great wealth in the United States is inherited wealth. The fact is that the world of economics is a world of change. Very few of the big corporations of 1910 are still with us, and this means that the fortunes those corporations created are disappearing. Of the 150 richest Americans, 26 are women, most of whom inherited their wealth, but more than a hundred of the wealthiest men made their money on their own. Review of the News, September the 29th, 1982, 35. This is not all. At present, new fortunes are being created by younger, younger men. Younger men! Yeah, younger men, yeah. At present, new fortunes are being created by younger men in microelectronics. They will, in a few years, displace the 150 whose fortunes will often be divided and dwindle. At the same I made burp with colon. No good. At the same time, New forms of energy and new developments in technology promise to appear in the next 20 years. Each of these will create new fortunes among a new crop of younger men. This has been the American story. In a changing economy, the centre of wealth continually shifts and changes hands. The great men of wealth of the horse and buggy days have now a family of great wealth in only a few cases. In fact, the wealthier the family and the corporation, very often the less likely it is to be innovative and receptive to change. The result is that the United States remains, 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 it remains, remains. The result is that the United States remains the land of opportunity and the place where the poor can rise to the top. The truth is that most of us are better off than our parents were. Our children will be still more prosperous. The standard of living for most of us has improved and will improve still more. But this does not mean that we have a problem-free society nor that we can be smug and self-satisfied. It does mean that a free society is a mobile one in which a man can better himself. The defence of freedom is thus a concern to all of us. It. What's wrong with deficit spending? 
Under consideration today is another constitutional amendment banning deficits. Banning deficit spending. The amendment would require that federal spending equal revenues and that federal expenditures cannot grow at a rate greater than the gross national product. The proposed amendment has been attacked by one of America's major newspapers as trivialising the Constitution. The purpose of the proposed amendment is to extend the Bill of Rights to cover our economic rights and prevent the federal government from passing confiscatory cac... Confiscatory taxes, economic rights, and prevent the federal government from passing confiscatory taxes. There is also the matter of common sense. How long can you and I as individuals survive economically if we run up a huge deficit each year? The federal government is well beyond a trillion dollars in debts and close to bankruptcy. Social Security is in serious trouble, and so are other programs. At the same time, Congress has passed the highest budget in his budget history. Highest budget history. At the same time, Congress has passed the highest budgets in history, and we are seeing also our largest deficits. Common sense should tell us that sooner or later a day of reckoning will come for all reckless debtors, whether they be persons or nations. There is, however, another aspect to this issue, the moral one. Debt living, whether in persons or nations, is a product of bad morality and it creates an even lower moral level as a consequence. Historically, Times of inflation have also been eras of lowered moral expectations, high crime, family conflicts and social disintegration. What we buy when we incur debt is a growing decay in the quality of life. Deficit spending is thus economically wrong and also morally wrong. It is also a serious political error in that it creates economic inflation and, with it, Social unrest, which leads to a distrust of political process. I look like processor. <laughs> leads to social thing. Okay, there we go. Social unrest, which leads to a distrust of political processes. Remember, it was massive inflation and political disillusionment which preceded the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, and the rise of Adolf Hitler. Any nation which indulges in sustained deficit spending first bankrupts and destroys its most stable citizens, and then it destroys itself. Thus, an amendment to forbid deficit spending by the federal government is a necessary step towards the survival of our form of government and of freedom. If you want to be free, don't take free money. There's no such thing as a lunch which is a free lunch, freely given as a lunch without monetary implications in the realm of the freedom. All right, where are we? Just pausing a minute. Let us continue. Nine. Who gets hurt with trade controls? In 1982, an interesting protest took place in Japan, and the United States was the target. Japan's 12 top petrochemical companies are in trouble. 
They are each losing about $4 million a month and they demanded that the Japanese government act at once to stop the flood of cheap feral... feral... Feral? Feral? Ferrets? Cheap foreign ferrets. A flood of them. Foreign chemical imports. Those cheap imports were coming from the United States, and American prices are half those of Japanese companies. Inquiry, October 1982. Two. This sounds very familiar, does it not? Some American companies complain about the cheap Japanese imports, and some Japanese companies complain about cheap American imports. Both sides say that the other country is costing them jobs. What's the answer to this dilemma? There is another factor that needs consideration before we answer that question. The consumer. If you and I, or the man in Japan, can get something from abroad at half the price, we save money, and it gives us more funds to spend on something else. This means that... Besides the American and Japanese corporations and their workers, our own personal economic well-being is at stake. If Japan taxes American imports heavily to make them closer in price to Japanese products, and if we similarly tax Japanese goods, the consumer is the loser. Economic freedom in international trade benefits the consumers, who are in the majority over any one or more industries. If our automobile industry cannot compete with foreign imports, all the protection we give it will only postpone the day of reckoning. On top of that, we need to realise that the United States has usually done best with new products and new inventions. By the time other countries start producing them economically, we're up ahead in a newer technology. It is a mistake to think, therefore, that foreign goods are a threat to us. They usually free us from one kind of production to a newer one. Some very able experts predict that we're on the verge of the greatest of industrial revolutions. It's happening in Silicon Valley in California and will change the face of American industry and vastly improve the standard of living. Economic freedom promises some dramatic changes and improvements in our material advantages Material Silicon Valley. They hail us, then they nail us. Silicon Valley. Ten. Should life be better at the top? A news item sitting on my desk has been irritating me. One Washington, D.C. commission head in the latter part of 1982 decided to have his office and his agency's chief counsel's office remodeled and redecorated at a cost of $85,000. Inquiry, October 1982, to... No, $85,000 is more than most of us paid for our whole house. As taxpayers, we have to pay for better housing and better offices for our bureaucrats. The agency head remarked. The place looks shabby the way it is. Hang on a second. It is recording. That's good news. The place is so shabby. Does your office or your house look shabby the way it is? Does your office or your house look shabby the way it is? Are you paying the boys in Washington to live better or to govern better? I would agree quite emphatically that people in superior positions should live better. The idea that an important executive should get no more than his lowliest employee is nonsense. I made a colon burp. I hope it will not come out in the recording. It is a sound biblical principle that a labourer is worthy of his hire. The more responsible and important his work, 
the better should the rewards thereof be. There are, however, limits to all this. Too often our top men in state and federal governments live in palatial circumstances with every kind of service and convenience provided at our expense. There is a very real distinction between a deserved compensation Let me... Sorry about that. There is a very real distinction between a deserved compensation and exploitation. Interestingly, it appears that, at some levels, the compensation of civil officers has made the transition from a just and due reward for services rendered to exploitation. Then we, the taxpayers, become the exploited. Life should be better at the top, but it should not be exploitative. Moreover, remember that we are paying all civil officials to govern better, not to live better. Some people are entitled to special privileges because they render important and special services, but when those privileges become exploitative, a distance is created between the men at the top and the people. The distance is growing, especially now, with both inflation and increasing unemployment. It is a very unhappy and foolish thing for federal officials to feel that large sums of money be spent to provide them with royal accommodations. In doing so, they bring to their office the contempt of the American people and they tarnish the forms of freedom. Alrighty. Let us keep going. Going, going. Boop. Eleven. Are we a nation of book burners? We periodically read that some group or other is upset because a school board wants to keep certain books away from school children, and the impression is given that some people known as the radical right are involved in book burning. How true is this? Moral majority, for one, is charged by some with book burning, but that group has never been involved in such activities nor has Eagle Forum. It is true that parents in many communities have objected to certain books because of their content and in the belief that those books are unfit for school libraries. It is also true that library... It is also true that libraries and library journals recommend certain books and reject others often because they are too conservative or too Christian. If we call the one censorship, we must also call the other the same. The fact is that both sides want children to get the best perspective on life and to cloud the issue with charges of book burning is to mip. Mip, 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 mip. Cloud the issue with charges of book burning is to misrepresent. Is Miss Pepper Ruth? Miss Pepper Sand. The issue with charges of book burning is to misrepresent facts. All the books in question can be bought by anyone at any bookstore. Noise, extraneous noise. The Christian school will obviously avoid certain books as not worthwhile or as definitely, definitely. Sorry, I'm just having a bit of trouble here for some reason or other. As definitely bad. Similarly, the public school, being governed by a humanistic faith, will select books which conform to its perspective and reject others. This will, of course, offend some parents. The solution is not name-calling. Basic to freedom is the fact of choice. If we deny freedom, we are denying choice. What these people who reel at the supposed book burning are really saying is that there can be no free choice for anyone except themselves. 
If I want the freedom to choose, I must also give that freedom to others. True book burning would be the prohibition of publication. It would involve stopping a book before it is printed. In some countries, nothing can be published without a state permit. Any violation of that process is severely punished. Ah. Sorry, some colon issues. No, that's, I'm going to have to re-record that. Colon. Colon. Backslash. Any violation of that process is severely punished. We have nothing even remotely resembling that in the United States. Not yet, at any rate. It is a very grave disservice to freedom to misrepresent issues and to speak of the threat of censorship where no such threat exists. In a potato, up in the pool, potato. Bing, 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 <laughs> 12. Who makes history? American UN Ambassador Jean Kirkpatrick in her book Dictatorship and Double Standards, 1982 wrote most tellingly of an illusion common to many of our professors, bureaucrats, statesmen and politicians. This illusion is the idea that vague social forces shape events rather than people. Ambassador Kirkpatrick cites evidences of this very dangerous myth. If social forces create events, then it becomes necessary for a civil government to engineer those forces which will create the desired results. Such a belief, however, makes people the creatures of forces rather than God's creation. It also reduces man to a helpless piece of driftwood on a notion of social forces. Such thinking is radically alien to our biblical faith and heritage. Our civilization and our country are the products of men of faith and action who shaped events and set forces in motion rather than being shaped by them. Hmm, a bit early for that. Nevertheless. I submit that this belief that social forces shape events is a new religion, not sound sociology. I submit also that it is a very damaging faith. It produces pessimism and a sense of futility, It cuts the vital springs of human action and channeled energy into self-defeating concepts. History is not a product of vague social forces, but very real peoples who, by faith, embarked on brave ventures and made great steps forward. Behind every great age of advance in history, we find men of action vitalised by a powerful faith, Forces do not exist in the abstract. A social force is the product of a people's faith and action. It has no existence in and of itself, and it cannot exist apart from a people's beliefs. Social scientists, in talking about such forces, have fallen into a naive deification of their own ideas. History is a human product, not an abstraction's work. Not surprisingly, these scholars have converted history into social studies to strip events of their human source and to ascribe them. (coughs) And to ascribe them to vague social forces. Such a faith, however, denies man freedom and reduces him to a product of vague, non existent entities or forces. 
Well, that was heartening, I must say. That was genuinely heartening. Indeed it was. Fake. Oh, let's not close everything without saving it. That would be a bad idea. Alrighty. Um, one, da, 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 da. Let's check. Yeah. Mm, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, let's do five and five. Thanks very much for tuning in. Oop, sorry about that. Thanks very much for tuning in um, to the Booth of Truth. Always a pleasure, never a chore. Good to have you with me in this place. And um, yeah, if you'd like to support the work of getting all of Rush Dooney's, uh published oeuvre, you know, but uh, except a couple of bits and bobs into the um, ears of auditors in Audible and other platforms, then you can do so. That's good news. By helping me do more better work by liking, sharing, commenting and or giving. Uh, you can give tax free if you're in the US or Canada at nathanteacher.com forward slash donations. Thank you very much. And where are we? See you soon.